Okay, let's uh, move on, Jerry, to the Let, Proposition 8 ruling. Yeah, let's, uh, the second court uh, ruling that, they came, that the Supreme Court dealt with Proposition 8 in the state of California. Let's, uh, why don't you go through the changes that happened with that? Okay, well, the, the origin of this ruling was back, really, I, could, I would say in 2008, a decision by the California Supreme Court that uh, suggested that uh, same-sex couples had a constitutional right to marry. Well, that led to a backlash and an effort that same year in 2008 that became known as Proposition 8, which was a voter initiative to let the voters of California decide whether, how they wanted to define marriage. And it was, you know, should we define marriage as exclusively a relationship between a man and woman? That Proposition 8 was enacted by, I think it was 53% of the citizens of California. And that was immediately challenged in a federal district court in San Francisco uh, as unconstitutional. And the, uh, the, the court allowed the proponents of Proposition 8 to, de to defend it, which they did vigorously. And uh, the court ultimately decided that Proposition 8 violated both the due process and equal protection clauses of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which are limitations on state action, not federal. Um, and so Proposition 8 was deemed to be unconstitutional and invalid. Now, the interesting thing about that case was it was based on federal constitutional law principles, which theoretically would apply to uh, all, all states. So, uh, and the other thing about this case that I think is important is that the court had some very broad uh, religious liberty language that addresses directly the perception of so many that these rulings are somehow going to impact uh, ministers, who, who they can or cannot marry. And so let me, let me quote from the court's decision. Affording same-sex couples the opportunity to obtain the designation of marriage will not impinge upon the religious freedom of any religious organization, official, or any other person, no religion will be required to change its religious policies or practices with regard to same-sex couples, and no religious official will be required to solemnize a marriage in contravention of his or her religious beliefs. So that was a significant recognition by the court that despite its ruling, the ruling itself recognizing the constitutional validity of same-sex marriage had nothing to do and in no way impacted ministers' religious freedom in deciding who they're going to marry and who they're not going to marry. Well, the proponents of, uh, well, let me just say this. The, the, the party that could have appealed this ruling, striking down Proposition 8, to the Ninth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals would have been the governor, Jerry Brown of California, and certain legislators. They refused to do so. And so here you have a law enacted by the people that the governor and the legislature would not defend. And so the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals allowed the original proponents of Proposition 8 to appeal it, which they did. And then uh, the Ninth Circuit went on to rule that the district court got it right that Proposition 8 was unconstitutional. So the Proposition 8 uh, proponents then appealed the Ninth Circuit's ruling to the United States Supreme Court. And here the Supreme Court had an opportunity, again, to make a sweeping ruling, recognizing everywhere a constitutional right by same-sex couples to, to marry. They didn't do that. Instead, I would say on a technicality, the United States Supreme Court dismissed the appeal on the technical grounds that the proponents of Proposition 8 did not have standing to prosecute the appeal. Standing is a very important concept in federal litigation, and what it, it's a constitutional requirement. And what it means is the litigants must have, uh, to any federal lawsuit, must have a, a, a direct interest in the outcome of the case. And just the fact that the proponents of Proposition 8 were citizens and desired this, they, they did not have a sufficient interest to, uh, to qualify for standing under the very uh, complex uh, definition of standing that the courts have come up with over the years. 
Now, um, so the court said the proponents of Proposition 8 didn't have standing. And therefore, the Ninth Circuit was in error to have heard the case because those proponents didn't have the authority to appeal it to the Ninth Circuit. So it vacated the Ninth Circuit ruling, which had the effect of reinstating the San Francisco District Court ruling that Proposition 8 was unconstitutional under the federal constitution. Uh, again, they avoided ruling on a constitutional right. So by this ruling, will ministers be required to perform sex, same sex marriages? Well, that's one of the two big questions. Yeah. And our church is gonna be required to perform them. So let's, let's take a look at that ultimate question. This is where the confusion is. This is where the anxiety is, Jerry, today. Pastors are asking, can I be in trouble? Can I go to court? Or can I be sued? Can I be prosecuted if a same-sex couple comes to me and wants to get married and I say that would violate my religious beliefs, I cannot do that? Are they gonna be in trouble? And that's what we wanna address here in the final minutes. Number one, the Supreme Court's two recent rulings did not address that issue at all. So uh, we're left to look at other authority. Now, I will say that in 37 states, the validity of state statutes and constitutions defining marriage as exclusively a union between a man and woman, those are still intact uh, until the Supreme Court decides otherwise. So for now, that, that's not an issue in 37 states. Uh, and You're for, located in one of the 13 states, if, though. That, that's going to be the issue. Yeah. Or if the Supreme Court recognizes a federal constitutional right for same-sex mar marriages, which is a possibility, as we've alluded to. So what about the fact that you're in a state where uh, same-sex marriages are lawful? Well, let me address that. Uh, and there's a, there's a number of points, I think, to make here. Uh, the first one is this. There are prior rulings by the United States Supreme Court that would suggest that the concept of religious freedom embodied in the First Amendment to the, to the Bill of Rights uh, is broad enough to protect ministers in making decisions as to who they're going to marry and who they're not. Let me quote from one. This is a, a, a case back in the 1950s that's still frequently quoted, where the Supreme Court said, it is a very different thing where a subject matter of dispute, strictly and purely ecclesiastical in character, a matter over which the civil courts exercise no jurisdiction, a matter which concerns theological controversy, church discipline, ecclesiastical government, or the conformity of members of the church to the standards of morals required of them, becomes the subject of its action. It may be said here that no jurisdiction has been conferred on the court to try the particular case before it, or that its judgment exceeds the powers conferred upon it. So this and many other cases I could quote by the United States Supreme Court, as well as lower federal courts, indicate there, there's a strong probability that the courts would recognize, even if they recognize same-sex marriage as legal, they're still gonna recognize the authority under the First Amendment guarantee of religious freedom of ministers to decide who they're gonna marry and who they're not gonna marry. The Supreme Court, uh, just last year in the Hosanna Tabor case, unanimously, now remember, the, uh, these two same-sex marriage cases were five to four decisions by the court. Uh, the Hosanna Tabor case last year was a nine to nothing unanimous decision recognizing the so-called ministerial exception, which says that the civil courts cannot get involved in employment disputes between churches and clergy. There's a lot of language in that case that uh, suggests that the reach of the First Amendment guarantee of religious freedom is broad and robust, and that would be another uh, defense you would have. And let me also mention this, which I think is a very strong point, and that is that when you, know, when you stop to think about it, there are many ministers in this country that refuse to perform marriages uh, for any number of reasons based on their doctor, doctrin, doctrinal uh, positions. And uh, let me mention what some of those are. How about if somebody came to a pastor, Jerry, and said, I want to marry uh, two women? Well, I'm not going to perform that marriage. It violates my religion. Really? You're, well, you, what, what about being sued? Uh, do ministers ever think about that? Or somebody comes in and says, I want to marry my mother, or I want to marry my grandson, uh, or I want to marry my dog, uh, or I want to marry my brother or my sister. Uh, or I want to marry my first cousin, which is legally recognized in 21 states, by the way. 
or I want to marry uh, somebody who's previously married and divorced. That's legal, but many ministers refuse to perform such a marriage for doctrinal purposes. Or I want to marry someone who's not a member of my faith or of our church's faith. Many pastors, resort, referring often to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, a passage of scripture which says, don't be unequally yoked to others. Uh, they, they view it as contrary to their religious beliefs to perform a marriage between a person, maybe a member of your church, and someone who's not a believer, not a Christian. Uh, have, ever, have they been sued? Uh, so there's just a number of reasons, Jerry, why ministers don't perform marriages based on their religious considerations. And in the 237 year history of this country, no minister has been prosecuted or found liable for refusing to perform one of these marriages based on religious views. And I would put same-sex marriage in the same category. Let me uh, ask you a question there. So if, if a state recognizes same-sex marriage, do you see it as a possibility that the courts could actually say if you refuse to do same-sex marriages in these states where it is legal, that we, you could lose your tax-exempt status? No, I don't think there's any way that that, I, I see no, I can't connect those dots. Okay, it's, it's a good, you know, that, I thought that was a good question. Yeah. Anything's um, possible, <laughs> but I, I just, we, we're dealing with probabilities like in quantum mechanics, and I, I just can't see that as happening. Now, uh, so just in terms of some conclusions here, uh, same-sex marriages are recognized as legally valid in those 13 states plus the District of Columbia. Let me mention those states, by the way. We've talked about them a lot. Those would be California, Connecticut, Delaware, Iowa, Maine, Massachusetts, Maryland, Minnesota, New Hampshire, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, and Washington. I've looked at each one of these state laws. I've just written an article for my Church Law and Tax Report newsletter, the upcoming article, uh, September, October uh, of 2013. And I quote each of these 13 laws, and in some cases, they're Supreme Court rulings of that local state Supreme Court. Each of these cases has a recognition of a broad right on the part of clergy to marry whomever they want based on their religious considerations. So I want to make that point very clear.